guys ready to say welcome? Okay, it's about 9.30, so I think we should get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to Session 5 of the Virtual Art Sessions. We are at Pike Central. Um, these have ran great. And as a reminder, these are all archived on the holler, uh, in the uh, art uh, holler at theholler.org. So you can review all the sessions. Um, and a second, I'll introduce Chris Epling, who you all know. And uh, I'd like for our students at Pike Central to do their quick welcome. Welcome to Pike Central. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, well, I hope everybody's doing okay this morning. Uh, welcome to uh, week five, session five. This is Penciling Your Page, part two. So, hope everyone is going and visiting the holler.org and checking out resources available there for tutorial videos and additional supplementary uh, information that's provided. Uh, we are at Pike Central High School this morning to continue with our next session. Um, if everyone, if anyone has a problem hearing me, type it into your message box and let Mr. Castle know and we'll try to take care of that. Um, behind you, you'll see kind of a, probably a little bit of a weak attempt to draw something familiar with uh, a Disney character that I did earlier. So um, I was working on that before we started. Kind of started turning it into uh, another type of character as I was drawing it. But penciling your page. Um, we have a tutorial video available on the holler that talks about um, how to approach this process. Now, I want to do a little bit of a recap before we get started this morning. Now, we are in week five. There's eight weeks in this program. The last week that we're going to be together is going to be centered around your work. So all student-created books, artwork, information will be provided for um, uh, you, you'll come in, we'll select a few to come in maybe and uh, show your work and talk about your work um, on a video for uh, to stream over the Quebec region. So it, it is about your work. All, all of the effort, all of the uh, time that's been put in to prepare for this, it is a new uh, step in, in the direction of link, linking up classrooms together in this way. Um, there, there are going to be hurdles we have to cross where it's very new, it's innovative. But um, it is all about your work. It's about students creating. And one thing that I haven't stressed enough during this program is that this is all about sequential art, which is a big fancy word for combining pictures and words to tell a story. Okay? That's what we're all about, creative writing and the visual arts. Um, I've seen a lot of really, really great creations to come out of, um, of what we've worked on so far. Uh, this week I got to see... Ted Hudson's book, Noah's Ark, that was delivered to his school. He was interviewed by WYMT television. Local newspapers are doing um, articles on him. He's going to be doing a book signing at Joseph Beth in Lexington. He has book signings already um, signed up there around Breathitt County in libraries. Um, he's also starting to visit elementary schools to talk to children about creating their own work. So there's no reason why we can't have and duplicate more examples just like Ted in our region. There's none. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about a recap before we get started. So far, this is what everybody should have. You should have a story, most importantly. We're in week five. The story was uh, the first couple of weeks building your story, the elements of the story, your character's plot. Um, you have your uh, conflict, conclusion, all of those things combined in, in creating a story. You should have select, selected a format. Your options were a picture book, chapter book, graphic novel, or comic book. So those were your four options. So you should have uh, a story. You should know the template you're using. You should have started work and finished your storyboard. So you would take your story, then you create those little rough sketches, those boxes, and you should have every uh, page of your, of your book outlined in these little rough thumbnail sketches. Um, also character design. Before you started your pencil, pencil uh, finished page, if I can talk this morning, you should know what your characters look like. You should draw them from different angles, that kind of thing. So you know exactly what your characters look like. Your setting, you should have thought about your setting. How do you pull in the characters, the story, and then put them into the setting and show that through, through illustrations and drawings or collages, okay? With all these, inf all these pieces together, you should have all the tools you need, the blueprints, to start working on your finished pages. Just like an architect goes into building a home. You don't just go to Lowe's or some other place, buy the wood, buy the nails. 
go, go to some location and just start hammering and putting up walls. You know exactly what's going to happen before you start. Okay, so that's the main point. So for penciling your page, now if you watch, I really suggest you go to theholler.org and watch these tutorials that we're making and creating. Okay, um, if you have went to theholler.org, you'll notice that we created a, an example for a finished page using um, a character that we came up with for the holler. I think his name was Tim the Tiger. And this was something that we just created as an example to show you how to approach a finished page. Now your coloring, your coloring is going to come during week seven or week six. Some I have to double check, but but we're still on the penciling portion of this project, okay? And um, if you watch that tutorial, it's going to show you how to approach your page. Remember that everything you do with your pencil page should be, um, you should be able to correct it. You're, I mean, you're drawing it in pencil. You should be able to go back, erase. You should be able to make changes if needed. We talked about uh, a little bit about color uh, on one of the videos. We've um, sent out materials to the schools. We've sent out colored pencils. And last week we talked about if you would, if you would like to use a, another um, medium, as we call it, to, to uh, put color to your book, if you have color, you can. If, you know, if you have, if you'd rather, if you have watercolor and you'd rather use watercolor, then there's no reason why you can't do that. But colored pencils is the is the choice of medium that we sent out to the schools because they're easy to use, okay, um, and and they're also. Um, um, you know, easily to share too, so we don't have uh, enough for every student. But colored pencils is kind of a step up above crayons, but they're a really great medium. Every book that I've ever worked on has has used either um, a combination of watercolor, colored pencils, and then digital too. So I'll open it in Photoshop and then I, I'll, I'll flesh it out in Photoshop, okay? All right, so please go to theholler.org and um, I want you to, to look at these tutorials, look at Tim the Tiger. Check those out and uh, use those. So story plus character design plus setting equals your storyboard, right? Your storyboard then is your blueprints. So you start putting all these pieces together. Now, some of you might be really excited about this whole uh, process. Others may be like, well, you know, this is kind of a lot of work. But for you who are excited about this, um, it's a great example to show you what it's like to work in the industry, in the publishing industry, uh, one day if that's something that interests you. This, this whole process has been geared to give you an idea um, about what that's like. So we're putting all these pieces together and we're creating um, something. And, and the really cool thing about it is if you like this process, if you have um, had a good time doing this, there's careers for you in this field. Uh, illustration, you could be an author, you could write, you could work as an editor, graphic design, that kind of thing. Okay? There's tons of careers in this field. I am going to be putting a link this week to the WIN website where you can start looking at the various careers out there for artists. There's tons out there. Okay? But my goal is to get you excited about creating and sharing your own work. That's the main goal of this entire process, okay? I want to mention something real fast before we get started. Um, there will be a summer camp this summer. It's going to be June 15th and July 6th at the Challenger Learning Center in Hazard. I don't know if any of you schools have checked out the Challenger Learning Center, but it's a great facility. It's um, 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 available to teach and incorporates math, science, and engineering, the STEM. Um, acronym and mathematics and they're also incorporating artwork so I highly encourage you guys to check out you can go to their website at clcky.com or you can call 606-487-3050 okay all right we have all these pieces together you should have started penciling your pages before we get started on the actual technical part of this I want to talk a little bit about a book that I read recently called writing with pictures and I have a copy of it right here and I showed you this during the first video when we were in McGoffin County this book if you like illustration if this is something that you would like to do one day this is a great book I highly suggest you picking up this book and reading it um, it talks about 
things that you typically would not think of when it comes to illustration. And I'm going to show you up here what I mean. There's a thing with illustrations and penciling your pages called rhythm. This has a, a lot to do with the story. The story guides the rhythm, but really it's separate in its, in its own right. When you think of rhythm, when you open up a children's book, rhythm is how the illustrations are put together in the book to take you and guide you through the story. Okay? There's millions of approaches to this, to, to establishing what we call rhythm. Now, I know I'm covering grade, grades uh, th uh, three, uh, third grade all the way up to 12th grade, so, you know, this stuff might be a little too um, advanced if it, if, if it applies okay. If not, just bear with me, okay? But rhythm is, is really important when you're illustrating anything you're doing from comics to children's books to chapter books to anything. When you're using pictures, rhythm is important. And I'm going to show you an example. In Yuri Shulvitz's book, Writing with Pictures, he talks about rhythm in this sense. If you can see here, these are pages that I've drawn out. These are actual pages from his, his book. Um, let's see, I have the name of it here somewhere. It's uh, m uh, One Monday Morning, okay? This is the title of this book. So these are actual pages from One Monday Morning. And I want you to pay attention to something here, if you could see this. You see the shadows that I've drawn? Now, if you open up one Monday morning and look at it, these are, you know, finished pages. You can see a, a child holding an umbrella walking, okay? For the purpose of this, though, we're going to show you what the, what the illustrations look like, but only, only the patterns, only the shapes. That's what we're paying attention to. So this is page 11 and 12 of his book. And what Yuri did, he separated one illustration into two pages. Okay, and what I've put on here is basically the silhouette or, or uh, the pattern of what you would see on these pages. Now, like I said, in the finished version, this is color. You can see the ladies here. They have umbrellas. They're walking ahead of the child in, in the picture. Okay, I'll color it in a little bit more so you can see what I'm talking about. But what Yuri did, he established rhythm for the book. Now, I know everybody's watched films, you've watched uh, animated movies, I think every, everybody falls into that boat. We've all watched a movie in our lifetime. If you think about film and sequential art, film is actually a very, very um, fast-moving sequential art uh, piece. That's what it is. It's a collection of pictures. It has sound instead of words. There are some words sometimes, but that's how I want you to think of this. Now, when you, when you watch a movie, when you, when you watch those opening scenes of, a, of, of any film or animated movie, the creators of that film, they ease you into the story, okay? There's tons of ways they can do this. You could have a very wide-angle shot zooming in to one location. Um, there's all these various ways. So illustration and children's book work a lot like film in that regard. So you can see the setting and the rhythm here. He's broken up what we call the picture plane. He shows on page 11 a, a little boy or a girl um, by herself walking. And then on page 12, the um, uh, older ladies here walking ahead of her. Okay? And it says, uh, this is the one part of the sentence for wording is on this page and the other part of the sentence. So he's even broke, he, he broke up the, the sentence even um, in, in a way that put one half of the sentence on this page and the other half on the other. Okay, this is what we talk about with rhythm. Now, this is something that that was probably more um, applicable to the storyboard phase when you're creating your storyboard. But while you're penciling in your pages, you can still change elements around to make them work better. Okay, another example is down here at the bottom. Over here, we have the court gesture. He's walking. He's broken up the picture plane again. We have these figures going into this uh, building, and you can see how how it leads the reader backwards this time. So here we're going into the movement of the book is going this way, where in uh, pages uh, 20 and 21, um, we see the ladies and, and the gesture. He's walking uh, behind them, uh, following them into the building. Okay, Rhythm's really important. Um, it, and, and the cool thing about this process is when you take a, a, a written page, you have words on a page. That's it, just words. 
And you look at those words and you read those words and you start thinking, how do I show this story through pictures? It causes you to think differently about a story. You have to think about elements of, of uh, the language arts. You have to think about these parts such as setting, plot, characters, conflict, conclusion, all of these things, rise of action. All of these things matter because if you're going to choose out of the first paragraph of your story what to illustrate, you're going to illustrate the most important thing, right? So it makes you think differently about a story, and that's how this applies to education in the classroom. Yes, it's drawing, but at the same time, though, these elements are being broken down. You have rhythm, you have everything, all the parts of the story broken down. So I want you to think about that as you move forward, okay? Now, next time, for next week, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about text placement, too, um, the words on your page. And I chose an example from Dinosaur versus the Potty by Bob Shea. Okay, now this is definitely a, a picture book, and it's definitely geared towards elementary level grade students. But hey, you can read it if you want, no matter what age. But anyway, if you can see this on here, this is a page from Bob Shea's book. This isn't the cover. This I think this is like page seven of his book, okay? So if we look at this, you can see that I'm going to draw in. Now, this is exactly how the page appears in the book. I've drawn it. Now, of course, it looks a lot better in the book, but that's okay. I want you to pay attention, though, to how he has placed the words on the page. Now, I told you early on that your options for adding words to your pages, you can handwrite those, you can draw the words on the page, or you can type those up in a Word document or in a Pages document, and you can then cut and paste those onto your page. So whenever we copy those, it will show up. If you choose to use a Word doc, a program, like type your story out and then cut and paste those onto your page, you have a lot of options with uh, what we call font. So you might be able to choose a, a really interesting font to go on your page. Um, if you handwrite it, you can, you know, you can also draw um, interesting font, which is basically saying what what the letters look like on the page. But um, you have those options, okay? But I want you to pay attention to how he constructed this page, and I'll draw the dinosaur out like this, and uh, then down here at the bottom is the grass. Here's his tail, okay? And he's jumping over a sprinkler system. I'll draw that at the bottom. Okay, and Bob Shea, when he created this book, it's full of these interesting um, layouts and choices for font. Okay, so there we go. That's what the page looks like in the book, and I have the book right here with me. Um, look at the different ways that he's uh, shown text. Up here at the top, we have big, bold letters for roar. At the bottom, we have this italic-looking type font uh, for... Um, the splashes. So, you know, think about how you're going to place these words on the page. I'll try to find this uh, this page in the book here somewhere too. Uh, this is important as well. Here's the page in the book, so you can see. So, um, this is probably the best way to show you is just open the book up. You notice here we have uh, white lettering. We have black. It's big bold. Over here we have uh, a different style. You can see the rhythm. First, the dinosaur is walking towards wherever he's going, and then. The, the next part is he's actually there, the sprinklers are coming on, and we have the action here, okay? So rhythm. Uh, I'll show you another example here. So he's using different style font. Look at the sizes. He's chosen to use a smaller font over here, um, big bold lettering over here. Now remember when I talked to you about how your design does not have to be uh, something similar to Marvel or DC. It, it, look how simple his design is, okay? And, and it's a little bit rough, too. You can see um, how he's not filled in all the corners and how it's a, it's a very, almost like a sketch on each page. All right? So this is a great example on different ways you can use font. I ask you uh, to resource and look up on your own and find interesting ways fonts are used in children's books and chapter books. I hope you've done that. If you have and you want to share that on the holler.org, I really highly encourage you to go on there, share what you find. If you find something that's really helped you, you could share that. Another student in another county, uh, it may help them too, okay? All right, so let's move, move ahead here. 
Now, this is a really old children's book. This one came out in 1927. There was one printing of it, and that was it. But it's one of the neatest uh, examples of how um, you can break up your page to show different elements. On this book, it's called Wee Willie's Wallopers Wonderings, okay? And it was in 1927 by Harry Miller. And I know you can't really tell what this is, but this is kind of just a, a sketch to show you how he chose to create each page. He, at the bottom, had a box that he put all of his text in, and then above that was another box where the illustrations or the artwork would go, okay? This is more, when I look at this book, I think of a chapter book. I think of chapter books being set up in this way. When you pencil your page, think about different ways to put the words on the page, okay? Um, now, there's another book out there called The Post-it Note Diaries. Those of you creating graphic novels or those of you creating comic books, this is one of the coolest ways I've ever seen uh, to lay out pages. Um, the creator of this book is Author Jones. Author Jones, he it's a funny first name, author, right? But Author Jones. Um, he, he's a cartoonist, obviously, and what he did was he took all these various stories from other people. Um, he had all these tons of stories. These are short stories in this book, but he drew each one of the uh, pages on post-it notes. So these are actual post-it notes. So we talked about panels, remember, with comics and graphic novels. Those are the boxes that, that your um, story is taking place in. But what he did, he used post-it notes for these panels, for these boxes. And I drew out a page here as an example. So we have all these tons of post-it notes. Post-it notes are the same size. He's arranged them pretty much in the same way. But inside these boxes is where all of the story uh, takes place, OK? I want you to uh, look up interesting ways that cartoonists, illustrators have used this. Now, here's another example. Uh, we'll be looking at this in terms of, of your cover. We talked a little bit last week about creating your cover for your book. That is probably the most important piece of artwork in your entire story, okay? It's the first thing people see when they look at your book. It has information about your book that's important. It has your name. It has, it has the title. It has the main characters usually. It shows a little bit of the setting on there. Your cover is very important. Um, I want to reference a book called Sleep, Big Bear Sleep, and this is uh, illustrated by Will Hillenbrand. I met Will Hillenbrand before. I, um, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's a Kentucky illustrator. Um, he's really helpful. If young artists have any questions, you can email him, and he will take time to um, write you back. My mentor uh, through this whole process, his name is Mark Wayne Adams. He's a Florida illustrator, worked for Disney. Um, he has helped me so much, and a lot of this process, if you're interested in doing this as a career, it's really good to ask questions from someone who has been there and done that. Now, I'm not even pretending to be, um, you know, on the level of Mark Wayne Adams or someone, you know, on that level, but I know a little bit about this process. I've, I've been involved with it enough. I'm a published author. I'm a illust published illustrator. I won awards for this stuff. If you have a question, okay, and you're serious about this as a career, if you if you ask me on the holler.org or you can email me, I don't care how you ask it, I will take I will take time and I'll answer those questions, okay? Every single one of them if you have any questions, all right? But the best way to reach me is the holler.org right now through this process, because that's where our community is based, okay? But for sleep, big bear sleep, pay attention here to how Will Hillenbred laid out his, his cover page. All right. First thing, and we have interesting text. We have um, italic, sort of small for the sleep. The big bear is big and bold, and then a smaller font for the sleep at the bottom. Okay. Uh, we have his name uh, here. It was written by Maureen Wright. Um, we see the bear who is sleeping. That's reference to the sleep in the title. He's falling asleep while working. And what this book is about, it's about a bear who does not want to hibernate. He does not look forward to sleeping. Uh, he wants to stay awake and enjoy, um, you know, the winter. But So he finds things to do to keep him awake. So one of the things he does in the story is he decides he's going to sweep up all the fallen leaves because it's in fall, it's, it's you know, snowing. And so that's one of the parts of the story. Um, so on the cover, what, what Will does is 
he actually shows he shows the bear, he shows the broom that's connected, and this little rabbit is a, a supporting character in the book. Okay, and all of these elements are found in the story. Okay, and you notice that the bear's sleeping. That's connected to the title. The little supporting character. We see the leaves. You see the snow in the background. Okay, all of these things are connected to the story. We look at setting. We got character. Look, we even have plot. When you look at this book, you can tell what's going on. The bear is apparently sleeping. It has something to do with sleep. Apparently, though, he has something to do. He's got a broom in his hand. He's falling asleep while he's either sweeping or in the process of sweeping. Okay? This tells us so much about what this story is about. Um, on the back, if you were to open this up, you can see that he's even taking this around to the back. So we have in the back here, um, Old Man Winter blowing the cold wind into the uh, down into the ground and the snow and all that. So I'll show you a page from this book too, real fast. Um, these are really amazing illustrations. He's such a he's a talented illustrator and uh, he's um, oops, dropped my book marker. Here, this is a great one. So you can see here how he's broken up. Well, I'm sorry, I dropped another thing out. <laughs> he's he's broke he's broke the picture plane up. You can see how it goes across the page. Okay. We see all these different elements going on. Um, the words appear, if you can notice, over there on the um, top left corner. Okay, This is uh, one of the best uses of space. We talked about that with perspective. Space is a, is a word that we use as artists to talk about um, your, what, what space you have available to put your pictures on. That's, that's, your, that's your paper or uh, the amount of space you have to work with. So this is a, um, um, a great reference for a lot of things we're talking about. Okay, we'll move on here a little bit. Another book for you cartoonists that are out there. It's a graphic novel by Jeff Smith called Bone. This is the probably I think besides another book called Blankets. Um, this is one of the largest uh, graphic novels, comic books ever produced. Right here, Jeff Smith from Ohio. He went to um, the universe, the University of Ohio. Um, he uh, is an amazing cartoonist. Now, Jeff's work resembles a lot of what you would think of the early, uh, I don't know if you, any of your students know about this, but there was um, uh, Scrooge, they had the ducks from Disney, uh, there were comic books that were out. Um, you know, they're, not, they're still being produced, but they're not really, really popular as they used to be. But um, his style of art is similar to that. And he has one of the, it's all black and white. Each page in this book, there's no color to it. Um, if you like Lord of the Rings, if you, if you like the fantasy type realm stuff, you, you'll really like Bone. Um, but the way he uses ink is, is amazing. When he lays out his pages, you notice the title. He's used this interesting font that he's drawn. He's created uh, the font for this. So, and there's something right here I want you to pay attention to that I think is really cool. And it probably won't make much sense if you haven't read this book, but we'll try. Um, this letter N, you notice how the B and the O and the E are, are, are bubble letters. But then we have this very sharp N here. Now, when I first looked at the cover of this book, I had no idea why Jeff Smith you know, did that. I didn't even think about it, really. But after reading the book, I totally understand. There's these characters. Uh, most of the characters in his book are these they're very round, um, you know, kind of humble-looking characters. They're, they're innocent, you know, they, they get lost in this world, they don't know how to get out of it, and, you know, you kind of, you think of them as like these sweet little characters or whatever, right? But then there's these other characters in the book that are these uh, evil rat-like creatures. They have sharp teeth, and they work for this, um, uh, the bad guy, the uh, antagonist in the, in the story, to go out and he, they try to hunt the bone characters, okay? And... Um, so when he chose to put the end like this, or the sharp end, that's in reference to those characters in the book, the rat creatures, because they have big sharp teeth. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. Hey, Mr. Kessel, how much time we have? Uh, half an hour. Half an hour. Great. Okay. So we're going to move on a little bit here. Um, Jeff Smith. If you're interested in graphic novels, I highly suggest checking that out. It may be in your library. It's a pretty big book. It might take you a little bit. So. This is kind of a sidebar thing I want to talk about for a second uh, in referencing to sequential art and how it's used to tell a story. We've talked a lot about 
uh, writing a story and then taking that story and putting it into pictures. That's what this entire project is about, okay? But there are other ways to do this where you have no words. When you get into the area of drawing pictures to tell a story with zero words, that is the, probably the, the, the truest form of sequential art, okay, or minimal words. The, the uh, more efficient you are at telling a story just with pictures and minimal words really, really uh, shows that you've, your, your level in this stuff of understanding how pictures are used to tell a story. And I've chosen to um, uh, draw kind of a comic strip, so you'll have to kind of bear with me. There'll be a comic strip, uh, two panels on this one, and then I have two additional panels in the back here, okay? But I'm going to show you how um, um, pictures alone can tell a story or a thought or an idea or something like that, okay? All right. So here we're going to have this little penguin or duck-like character, and he's going to be building a snowman. I'm going to draw this out for you because I want you to really be able to see this, okay? Um, the character in the first panel, we're establishing our setting. We have a um, um, little bit of our plot here. You, you can see that the little duck character or the penguin is um, building a snowman. We know it's in winter, and we have all these things that we need to understand what the story is about right here. In the first panel, starting out, it's um, relatively simply grown, not a lot of detail in it, and so there we go. So you can tell that this is a this is a little a little penguin-like character, and he's building a snowman. Okay, first panel, we understand a lot about the story already. In the second panel, we're going to show a little bit of action here. We're going to continue the plot. In this panel, the little penguin. He's going to place the head of the snowman on the two other parts. So the story is continuing. Um, the plot is continuing. You notice there's no words here, right? And we'll draw the snowman. Now, if you, if you attempt to do this, if you show the same setting over and over, one of the things that's important to do is to draw the uh, same picture. Um, that's kind of hard to do, to make it look as if, you know, this is just the same, the same uh, picture as this, but continued on. So we see the little, the little penguin guy, and he's pushing the, the part here onto the snowman's head, here, right? He's trying to lift it up. Um, he's having a little bit of um, some struggle doing that. He's really stretching out to put it up there on top of the other two um, uh, mounds of snow, okay? So then we continue on. In this panel, we're continuing on with the plot. This, the little penguin has the snowman's head on him. Again, you want to draw this exactly how it appears on the first two panels, or as close as you can. I could do a better job at that if we were had more time, but for the purpose of this, this works fine. So we got him standing here. He's looking up at the snowman. He finally got the head on the snowman. He's probably feeling pretty good about himself now. Let me draw the other arm coming out here of the snowman. So there we go. So in this one here, the little penguin, has, he has the head on the snowman. He's achieved his goal. And then in the last panel, we can uh, have the conclusion. So in, in these four little panels, we've established um, the conflict, the parts of the snowman. Um, the conclusion here, the resolution, doesn't turn out so great for the little penguin because the snowman is toppled over, landing on him, and you can tell that's happened because we have the snowman laying on its side and we see the little penguin's hat underneath the snowman. Okay. Now these four panels had no words associated with the story but it conveys an idea, a thought. You can tell what happened. It moves you along, and it makes a point. All right? This was actually created by Philip Jackson. He does a cartoon strip. It's syndicated called appropriately uh, Sequential Art is the name of the, of the comic strip. So if you want to learn more on how to use just pictures alone to convey a thought or an idea or tell a story, 
uh, research and look up Sequential Art, the comic strip by Philip Jackson. Now we're going to talk a little bit about next week. Um, penciling your page is broken up into two parts. If you don't go onto the holler.org and watch the tutorials, you're missing a ton. You might be saying, well, what has uh, Christopher shown us last week and this week about penciling your page that has to do with technique, how to hold your pencil, how to put the lines on the page, um, coloring? Uh, we haven't seen any of that. He's shown us examples maybe of things that pertain to this, but we haven't seen any uh, you know, real, real techniques. If you haven't seen any techniques yet, that's because you're not going to the holler.org. There's a video created for, for um, each session, uh, starting with the second week, that walks you through character design, setting design, using perspective. There's a video we created last week for penciling your page, where I, I took a mock storyboard, one that I created for this program. I drew the um, storyboard box out, real sketched it out, kind of. Then we moved over to the table, and you can walk along with me through the steps of penciling your page. Okay, we penciled the page in, we then um, had it exactly the way we wanted, we erased a few times, and from there uh, we, we put the black border around the, the lines we're going to keep, and then we colored. I used colored pencils to show you different methods of using colored pencils that you may not think about. Um, combining different colors. Uh, the example we used was Tim the Tiger. Tim the Tiger's orange, okay? But you wouldn't believe that inside of that orange you can use red, blue, and yellow in certain ways to show shadowing. And we're going to be doing that a little bit more. I'm going to go after this uh, to the holler, and we're going to create another tutorial, Penciling Your Page Part 2. And at the end of that, we're going to talk a little bit about color. Now, color is reserved, I think, for week um, 7 or 6. But we were breaking into it a little bit to kind of uh, go ahead and start in that topic because um, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big area to cover, um, especially if you're using different mediums, okay? So go to theholler.org. Check out those tutorials. They really help, and they go along with what we're covering, okay? All right. So for next week, we want to continue to pencil your pages using your storyboard, okay? Your storyboard's your blueprint. Um, pencil the pages in. However you lay your story out, it's up to you, okay? Um, like I said earlier, this is so broad. How you could design your book, there's so many options. It's, it's, it could go off into infinity on how many options you have, okay? So what I'm trying to do, though, is to show you some basic uh, fundamentals to go by in order to help you in however you're creating your story, okay? So for next week, continue to pencil your pages in. Okay, um, go to the holler, watch those tutorials, check those out, use those. If you want to comment on them, great. If you have questions, that's even better. If you need to know how to draw a particular thing or want me to do that, let me know. I will help you or find resources that will help you. Okay, um, coloring, that comes next week, but we're starting that again. And share your work too. I really want to see more work. We had some uh, students' work that are posted on the holler now. Um, from um, various counties, and I want you to go and check those out, look at them, see, see what other students are doing, okay? It's real important to become involved with this. Now, last night I penciled a little bit of this because it took a lot of time, but we have a, a character here. Um, I'm not really sure what this character is or who it's supposed to be. Um, it kind of looks a little bit from Disney, but we were talking earlier, the students here, and we they, they were a little convinced uh, something about Monster High or something, right? Like I, 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 th I, think it, I think it's going from Disney to Monster High all of a sudden. And maybe the mascara. I don't know. But anyway, um, I, will, I will ink this in while we're finishing talking. And one more thing, too. Any of the students out there in the various counties, if you have access to an art room, there's a good chance you're going to see one of these little wooden guys. I bet some of you might even have one. And you may have wondered uh, from time to time, what in the world is this for besides, like, I don't know, put it in strange poses on my desk, okay? But what this little thing does is, remember the Marvel method? We talked about that. Uh, it's in a tutorial on the holler. We talked about it, I think, during week three. Um, these little guys you can purchase at Hobby Lobby. I think they even have them at Walmart. And what this is is you position this in ways that you want your character to appear on the page. So let's say we're going to have your character setting down. 
And you remember the marble method, we used circles, right? We used a lot of circles to kind of make our skeleton. So let's pretend this little guy is going to be using a computer. Okay, so there you have a little guy sitting down for different angles, different perspectives, you can draw this. And what you would do, even from behind, see? So what you would do is you position this on the table in front of you, and you draw out the circles that you see. That's what this is used for. Once you have the circles on your page, you go back then and add in this detail. Okay, you can put where the eyes go. And the neat thing about this particular one is it has a little line going down. You can see a little bit, almost looks like an owl face. But you can see this little uh, crease going down the middle there. And what that crease is, is what I talked to you earlier about. Um, when you draw your circle for your head, you put that line down it, and then you put the marks for where the nose and the ears and the eyes will appear. So this kind of helps you, and you can turn the head and see where the uh, center of the, of the head will be in your, in, your, uh, in your drawing, okay? All right, so I'll go ahead, and if we have any questions today, go ahead and type those in while I'm inking this. And um, uh, Mr. Castle will let me, hope, will let me know, hopefully, uh, uh, if we have any questions. I'll try to answer those, okay? So, um, again, um, I, I'm going, I, I, I had a book today. Let me see if I just will break from the picture for a second to make sure I got it here. Okay, I, I apparently left it in the car, but that's okay. Um, I brought a copy of Ted uh, Hudson's book, Noah's Ark, to show you. I'll bring it today during the tutorial, and I will show you during the tutorial, okay? But um, that's what I want. I want students to create. I want us to share. I want you to get involved with this process, okay? So basically, I penciled this, this uh, character out, and now I'm going to go back, and I'm going to choose what lines I'm going to use. And what I would do, if we had more time, I would actually go back after I finished putting the ink. I'd let the ink dry first. Then I would go back and I would actually um, erase all the pencil lines. So what happens is it appears as though you have just created this character from nothing because the pencil lines do not show up usually whenever you uh, copy it or scan it for publication. Okay, so. You pencil first, and, the, and penciling your page is, is, is the time where you can make mistakes and erase and change and develop your story or whatever you need to do, okay? It's real important to take your time during this process, um, get your page exactly the way you want it, the look of your page how you want it, that kind of thing. And for those cartoonists out there, um, you can use Sharpies. Sharpies are great. We're supplying schools with Sharpies. Um, if you have a thinner pen, so you see you have, um, what I mean by that is the, the tip of this pen is pretty thick, okay? If you have another pen that is like this one, where you have a fine point, and you can see the difference in those two just from there, um, you can take the fine point for these little details here, and you can go back and add those in, okay? So use different tools available to you um, to add these details in, okay? We have any questions at all? All right, we have one. Um, will each student have a press printed book or, or their work, or will there be compilation of student work into one school book? Okay, um, we have a binding machine. Now, we, there's, there's a, in the printing process, you have a thing called offset printing, and then you have um, um, various ways to, to do a printed case book. Now, a case book, when we say that, is hardbound, okay? And to manufacture or to produce these, we'd have to do large quantities, okay? Um, and what we've planned on doing is this. For this process, we purchased a perfect bound binder. That means it's going to be using glue, not staples, not coils. We're going to glue. We can glue anywhere from five pages all the way up to 30 or 40, okay? There's no limit. If you have a large book over 30, 40 pages, we'll be able to bind it. Now, based on what we create, we're going to have book signings, we're going to establish events for students as much as possible. If there is one or two or three or 10 or 20 books that really stand out, we will look into perhaps getting those printed 
and published, not just printed, but published with an ISBN number, an LCCN number, uh, barcode, the whole nine yards. Listed in Bowker Books, with the Dewey Decimal, the new version of the Dewey Decimal System, will be listed in Bowker. Um, and you can even have those for purchase then at that point. But that's why I'm stressing to the students, take your time. This is an opportunity here. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity. I wish this came around when I was, was out when I was in school. Um, I, I would like to think I would take advantage of it and do a good job. I may have not, but looking back now, I, I wish I had, you know, if, if that was available. But another thing, too, I want to stress, um, you know, we, this program is made available through KBEC and, and UNITE. And UNITE is, is an organization that really puts this mission out there of bringing awareness to drug abuse and, and alcoholism. And I want to take a second, though, to talk about that for the 32 participants still here, okay? If you enjoy creating, sharing, whether it's film, writing, uh, illustration, um, whatever your interests are, sports, has maybe has nothing to do with drawing. It doesn't matter. Cheering, education, uh, music. If you choose to go down the path of taking an illegal substance and putting it in your body, you may, at that point, I'm not going to say the first time you do it, everything falls apart, but I will tell you this. The first time you do it, your chances of working as a career or in some sort of professional environment doing what you love is cut more in half. You might as well just go ahead and say, I'm playing with fire in the sense that all the things that I want and love and want to do are going to be ripped away from me. And it's that serious. Lives are shattered. Um, people's entire futures are evaporated in front of their eyes. Now, there are people that come back, but you don't want to go down that road. Don't roll those dice. If you ever are in a situation where someone offers you a legal substance, okay, alcohol even, I would very, I would highly caution you to stay away, okay? Because like I said, every time you mess around with this stuff, you could kiss this goodbye. You could kiss your name on a book goodbye. You will never see a CD with your music on it. You can kiss cheering at a college goodbye. You want to play an instrument in a band or, or go in to do that in school, it's gone, okay? So stay away from that stuff, all right? Please. Um, and another thing, too. Art therapy, and this is a huge part of this, we have students who go through a lot. Now, I know personally that students go through stuff. You know, my problems in, in my late 30s, compared to someone in high school are different. I remember in high school, my problems, um, but we all have problems. And if you're going through something that's rough, this is a great outlet, okay? This is a wonderful way to express whatever you're going through, okay? I hope everybody has a ha, had a good time today with the uh, session. Um, you, um, Mr. Cass, do you have anything you wanna say before we go? Um, if anyone is on from Painsful Independent, please stay on for a few minutes so we can verify our connection for next week. Next week's session, session six, will be from Paintsville Independent Schools. Paintsville Independent. So I'd like to thank um, um, Aaron and uh, David from the um, holler.org for coming out today. And uh, Bobby Sullivan, too. He's here today as well. Thanks, everybody. I hope you had a good time. I can't wait to see what you've created. Thanks to Pike Central students for, for putting up with me, having my back to you guys this whole time. Um, I'm going to check out their artwork after this. I'm looking forward to see what they've created. So thanks, everybody. And I'll see you in the classroom next time, okay? Thank <laughs> you.